Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Kaufman from Pollinator Partnership, and I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining us for the fourth workshop in the Pollinator and Habitat Technical Training Workshop Series. This workshop is focused on project implementation and early stage management. We would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's workshop by submitting questions for each of the presenters through the Q&A function, which can be found either on the bottom or right-hand corner of your screen. Questions can be entered during and after each of the presentations. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Joshua Sage. Josh has worked for the Boone County Conservation District located in Northern Illinois since 2001. He's a graduate of Western Illinois University and has been participating in natural areas management since the late 1990s. He has been working in conservation long enough to witness the great strides the field has made over the last 25 years. He's especially proud of the progress we have made in establishing high quality, diverse plantings and in managing invasive plant species on a landscape scale. Please welcome Joshua Sage. Hello, my name is Josh Sage, uh, Director of Natural Resources at the Boone County Conservation District, which is located in Northern Illinois. I'm going to be speaking about the first half of module four uh, project implementation. So the agenda this afternoon, I'm going to touch briefly on seed collection, uh, seed storage, as well as uh, the conservation district methods for creating seed mixes. Um, move on a bit to talk about uh, site preparation and go really heavy into different seeding techniques, things I've done in the past things that I think uh, work really well and what our kind of evolution in that process. So we'll be talking about conventional agriculture equipment, uh, seed drills, and then uh, a lot about broadcasting and frost seeding. And, and I'll end with what I, what I refer to as considerations, things that might come up in a project that maybe we're not thinking about or maybe we're just starting to think about. So hopefully, if you're not thinking about these things already, I'll, I'll put them on your radar to, to be thinking about it at, during your next projects. So in, in 2020, the Conservation District uh, staff, along with volunteers, we rely heavily on volunteers with the habitat work that we do. We ended up collecting uh, 676 pounds of seed, 165 different species, and a fair market value just shy of $91,000 with COVID kind of shutting everyone down. And then once we started ramping up again, it was still quite cumbersome um, to still get that amount of, of seed. We, we felt pretty good about it. So in our with our seed collection efforts, we definitely focus on the projects scheduled for the next winter. So we'll take, for instance, the growing season of 2020, we collected seed, clean seed, created seed mixes for the projects that we would be planting in what I call the winter of 2020, uh, 2021. So December, January, February. We do at this point all of our seeding on top of snow in the winter, and I'll talk a lot more about that later on. Uh, if, if we have a large project, we're not able to collect everything we need for a growing season. We're able to collect for, uh, for multiple seasons because we're able to store seed to preserve viability. So this is a, a, a good picture of a large group of people helping us collect uh, a native grass. Uh, a lot of hands make light work, right? So if you get a large volunteer crew out to help you collect seed, you can collect a lot of seed in a little bit of time. So the conservation district, we manage 4,000 acres. Most of that's set aside for, for habitat. I, I refer to these natural areas. And so we have access to over 400 species, uh, wildflowers, grasses, sedges, uh, rushes, trees and shrubs. We never collect that much. Uh, we never collect from all 400 in a growing season. Uh, if, if it's something we don't need, we're not gonna collect it to just collect it. We'd rather that seed uh, fall onto the landscape to help perpetuate the species that are already on our, on, on our sites. And we're, we're collecting anything from remnants. So pre-settlement 
conditioned habitats to uh, recreations and restorations, uh, some that are, are quite old and, and some new plantings. And again, the diversity of our harvest really depends on projects that we're, we've got coming up. With our, our seed collection efforts, it's as simple as staff or volunteer going out with a, a bucket thrown over their shoulder, going after an individual species. And through the bulk of the growing season, this is usually what we're doing. We're going out with staff, whether that's seasonals, uh, full-time staff, and, and again, uh, volunteers, because we rely so heavily on them to help us get the work done that we need to get done. So along with something as archaic and simple as a bucket with a, a strap on it, uh, we, we do have tractors. We have one tractor with a, a seed harvester attached to it. And this, this allows one staff member to go out and collect a lot of seed in a short amount of time. So this is a basic tractor, small utility type tractor with a front loader on it. Attached to the front loader is a, uh, basically a big bin with a brush in front of it. And that brush is being powered by that white box in the rear of the tractor. That white box is connected to the power takeoff of the tractor. The power takeoff of the tractor is engaged, it spins and it moves fluid through a closed system and basically moves that brush. So you can control the, the brush's speed, speed with the, the throttle of the tractor. Um, and then with it being on a front loader, you can make adjustments quickly on your height. So if you're going through an area like this, for example, is a little blue stem, uh, you're going through an area like this and you run into a patch of say solidago or some sort of weed you don't want in your seed mix, you can just bring that front loader up and over the weeds or, or the species you really don't want in your mix and then get through it and bring it back down, which is really nice. And you're able to collect very efficiently and, and, and avoid some of those uh, weedier species in your mix that you probably don't want there. Another seed harvesting tool I don't like quite as much. It's it's kind of a it it's a standalone. It's got a little gas motor on it. It's pull, a pull behind. You can't make adjustments as quickly. Uh, it's just a little bit more cumbersome than the front loader type. But same mechanism, a uh, gas motor turns a belt, belt turns a, a big brush, and it sucks the seed into a bin. So this is a little blue stem harvest after a, a few afternoons of one, one person in a tractor uh, going after a little blue stem. We have a number of what we call grass plots where we manage them for seed harvest. So we'll have all different types of grasses in plots where we're able to control weeds to keep them as weed seed as pot weed seed free as possible. And then we're able to go in with equipment, collect a lot of seed and, and feel pretty confident about not having a lot of weed seeds in, in that uh, mix right there. All right, so on quickly to seed storage. When we're so we're out in the field collecting seed, whether that's by machinery or by hand, and then we take it back to our facility where we lay it out in numerous ways to make sure that it, it dries and cures completely before we put it into storage. So these pictures are just some of the tools that we use to dry our seed. Pretty simple, a lot of reused lumber, uh, building some sort of shelving cabinet unit. Uh, we like screen screen helps with air movement and we're able to take uh, fans but whether it could be as simple as a box fan and blow air through uh, to, to make sure that seed gets stored dry the last thing you want to do pull your seed out ready to make your seed mix and it's just a big uh, chunk of mold and that one on the left we refer to as the seed barge it's it's quite a tank but we're able to move it so we can move it in and out of the sun to help dry and cure seeds that, that need that. Um, so if the sun's out, we'll pull it out of the uh, barn in the morning, let the seed cure the seed all day, pull it back at the end of the day. If it starts to rain, we just pull it back into the, into the barn. 
another close up of our our seed racks that we built. We've got one room that's just full of these racks, every wall. So I mentioned earlier about being able to um, store seed to uh, kind of hold viability. And this is our homemade seed cooler. It's basically a big room, probably 12 by 12 in size, uh, well insulated. We poked a, an air conditioner through one of the walls and the air conditioner runs, but an air conditioner will only get so cold, it won't really get as cold as you need for a, a cooler type setting. So that uh, little tool upper left called a cool bot, that is connected to the thermostat of the air conditioner and it's basically overriding the thermostat of the air conditioner making the air conditioner think that it's actually warmer in the room than it is. So it overrides the air conditioner thermostat and becomes the thermostat. So I'm able to get temperatures down to where I like them. Um, just what, what my goal is, simple math, is I want my humidity and my temperature to add up to 100. So 50% humidity, 50% temperature, or 60-40. Or Somewhere in those, that range, I, I feel pretty good about. The colder you try and get it in, in this cooler, the higher hu your humidity gets, and you really, you really start to fight it. So you've collected your seed. Uh, you've cured your seed. It, it's dry. It's not going to mold. Uh, you're, you're about to put it into storage before it goes onto the project site. Uh, make sure it's put in something that can breathe. We use anything as simple as a paper grocery bag to a, a lightly woven poly bag. And we really have come to like these uh, cardboard barrels. What we'll do is we use these to, to create our seed mix. So we'll, we'll, as our seed mixes are developed, we'll put them in these barrels. They breathe, and then when it's their time to go out into the field, we'll put them into a pickup truck, and out, out they go. The one kind of bugaboo about these is you can't get them wet. We're fortunate. We've got a pickup truck with a topper, so we'll roll a bunch of these into the truck out into the field. Uh, if there's snow on the ground and which we want snow to be on the ground when we're seeding, we'll lay a tarp out and then kind of lay these out in, in our um, the spot where we're working out of. So these work really well. I recommend them. They're not the cheapest things. And again, you have to keep them dry. Quick note on, on seed cleaning, getting to the point where it's ready for a mix. Uh, we do a lot of seed cleaning by hand and we do uh, some of the heavy lifting with this tool called a hammer mill. And it's it's basically, you're beating things to the point where they'll go through those the holes in those grates. So you can see on the far right, different holes, different size grates, and that you just kind of gauge what size you want your, your seed and shaft to, to get pushed, pushed through. Uh, makes quick work of some of the bulkier things. Uh, it does a really good job of uh, like, Big blue stem, or I'm sorry, excuse me, little blue stem, when you clean it, uh, when you collect it, it can be pretty dirty. This at least knocks stuff uh, to a, a, the same size material so it goes through your seating equipment a little bit easier. So then from the hammer mill, depending on how clean we want it, we like to get our seed as clean as possible. So we've got a really good gauge of how many seeds per square foot we're putting down. Uh, so we can go to these kind of hand screens to, to get our seed even cleaner. And again, a lot of this is done with staff and a lot of it is done with volunteers, uh, usually October, November, December, when the weather starts to turn and before we're really getting seed mixes out, we're spending a lot of time doing stuff like this. <laughs> Uh, site preparation, briefly, I, I will tell you uh, my, my teachable moment, I guess. Do not underestimate the power of invasive plant species within the seed bank <laughs> and the seed banks that they have created. Um, th this is a struggle for, for the Boone County Conservation District. I'm guessing this is probably a struggle with everybody who's trying to convert succession weedy 
weedy habitat into something more diverse, something more helpful to, to the local uh, flora and fauna. So here's my teachable moment. This is succession gone horribly wrong. Uh, this is one of my first kind of heavy duty habitat projects, starting with really awful habitat and, and needing a lot of energy to, to get it looking like something uh, much better. So this is an old dairy farm. You can see the silo in the background. Um, the farm was purchased by the Boone County Conservation District, and, and for lack of a better term, it, it sat fallow. Uh, so it was cool season pasture, grasses, Eurasian bromes mainly. Um, the cattle were taken off, and the opportuni opportunistic trees and shrubs started to move in. Uh, you name it, it's there uh, for Northern Illinois succession unmanaged. We're, we're looking at honeysuckle, buckthorn, choke cherry, um, Eurasian elms, ju just a, a mess. The best thing there was box elder, if that tells you anything. Uh, so this was going to be a complete from scratch. So we started with this tool. I'm guessing some of you in the land management field have, have used this machine or hired this machine out. It, it's called a Geo Boy. It's got a very light footprint, wide rubber tracks, and on the front of it, it's got a lot of power. And on the front of it is what's referred to as a forestry mower. And basically what it does is it drives through an area like this in the background, weedy successional, uh, woody perennials, and it, it just turns them into mulch where they stand. Uh, and it, it really does make a mess of it, but it's, it's the most efficient way to do it. I can never hire chainsaws to go in and knock out in a space that big, and I definitely don't have the staff to, to take the time to be able to knock that stuff out. So it's not pretty. Um, site users are offended by this. This being one of the major first projects we had, we took a lot of grief from from doing this, what is a conservation district doing cutting down trees? And there's definitely uh, an opportunity for, for education there. Uh, so we, we spent two to three, it's been so long, let's say three growing seasons of, seasons of trying to knock back the woody perennials because uh, we just didn't want to have to do that again, right? Uh, what, what we failed to do is focus on the, um, herbaceous weeds that were there. Focusing on the woodies for two to three years, we did maybe one spring for total vegetation control to knock out all the herbaceous, the, the nasty broadleaves and grasses that were there. Um, that was not enough. <laughs> uh, so we, we kind of went back to the drawing board on it. You, you get to this point, you know, you, you control the weeds, you put the seed down, you mow aggressively for two or three years, you try and get fire in the ground and then you watch. And we watched it and it wasn't that good. <laughs> we were hoping for better. So now you come to this point where you, okay, where, when do you pull the trigger to start over? We, we've got plenty of other work to do. We, we did put a lot of energy into this. Uh, so we gave it longer than we should have probably three or four growing seasons, two burn cycles, just hoping that we'd release some of the native seed that we put down. Uh, it did not happen. We ended up starting over and we were very, very aggressive with it. Uh, we took two years of total vegetation control. So we sprayed it, let the weeds flush, sprayed it again with a full spectrum, just trying to milk that weed seed bank as best we could. Uh, so this is the project looking at the silo uh, from east to west. We finally have native vegetation installed that, that's worth managing, that's worth keeping, that's providing good habitat. Uh, so it, it was a long time coming, but, but we did it. Uh, we, we learned a lot, we got aggressive, and it paid off. All right, so we, uh, excuse me, seeding technique. I'm uh, going to talk briefly about drilling or basically conventional agricultural equipment, uh, broadcasting, and then with broadcasting, uh, talking heavily about frost seeding. 
This is conventional ag equipment, right? That's a 50 horsepower tractor, uh, three point hitch, power takeoff, uh, pulling a, a no-till seed drill, probably eight feet working width, I would think. And it's, it's designed actually for native seed. It's got three bins on it. You can see the tops of the bins. The rear bin is for a cover crop. Uh, we would usually put oats in it. The middle container would be for your fluffy native seeds, uh, mainly your grasses and some of your large forb seeds. And then the front container was, is for small forb seeds. And you're able to calibrate this and, and get your pounds per acre in. Uh, so what's happening is that wheel in the front you can see is called a coulter and it's kind of loosening the soil. Uh, and right behind that coulter are V-shaped discs. And what's happening is the seed is coming out of those containers, those three bins, falling between those V-shaped discs, discs, and it's getting set into the ground in, in slits. And then in the rear are packing wheels that are pushing the seed into the soil to get it uh, seed soil contact. Uh, you make straight lines, it's easy to tell where you've been. You can calibrate and get exactly how much seed you want per acre. Uh, it, it's very efficient in getting what I've learned uh, native warm season grasses established. Anything other than that, it's a chore and it, I don't think it's as, as successful as it should be. So this was an evolution. This was the, this is the Boone County Conservation District's no-till drill and it was an evolution from drilling to broadcasting. We started ripping parts off the drill. We had seed falling directly onto the ground. Um, seeing a little bit better results with that, but still uh, not as good as we were wanting. So probably 10 years ago, we, we switched. We would always drill in the spring. So we're planting in April, May, depending on when the weather broke. Uh, we, we switched 180 about 10 years ago and, and switched to um, broadcasting on top of snow. Gives us a larger window for seeding, but we're definitely reliant on, on nature to get the conditions that we need. Uh, so this again is that, that tractor, but now it's a, a much simpler, much cheaper tool on, on the back of it. This is under a thousand dollar broadcaster. You can get at any farm supply uh, store it, and it, it does a really good job. There's a lot of different functions on it to, to be able to calibrate it. Um, so it, it's cheap, it's simple, it, it's, it's right up the Boone, and, Boone County Conservation District's alley. Uh, so this is looking inside the, the bin, the hopper, and this is our one of our large seed mixes. So it's got a lot of larger forbs on it, uh, our fluffy grass seed, and this is what I refer to as our matrix. So we'll lay a, a mix like this throughout an entire project area just to kind of make sure we get natives spread throughout and we get good distribution of grasses. So when it's time for fire, we'll get fire to kind of push through an area. So seed on top of snow is, is ideal because you can see where you're putting your seed and the tire tracks in the snow help gauge where you've been. So we're looking at, you know, call it 100, 120 seeds per square foot depending on the project, depending on how much seed we have available to us. Uh, so that's a really good, I love this picture. Um, as you can see, the, the tires are kind of cross hatched on this. You can confidently put down two seed mixes per snow. So here we've got one seed mix going north-south and one seed mix going east-west. So usually we lay that larger seed mix matrix down first, say north-south, and then we'll lay our smaller seed mix because we're calibrating it, a lot less seed coming out, just smaller seeds. So the, the gates are, are a lot smaller. Um, we're, we're putting that small seed out second, and this would be, I guess, east-west. Uh, so if you need a third or fourth, you can either run it at an angle or, or wait for that next snow. There are some spots where we're doing um, uh, three seed mixes, so sometimes we have to wait for that next snow. So after we get the matrix down, we'll go in by hand 
to lay seed down um, and <laughs> back to the simple tool of, of humans and buckets uh, with straps on them. And uh, this is a, a group of staff and volunteers going out to a site. You can see the tractor in the background and, and humans are putting down um, the, we, what I refer to as a more conservative species. So hand planting, uh, planting in groups, uh, are more conservative species. Uh, we're doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, natural process, probably how forb seeds would have established and expanded, uh, helps with seed viability through pollination. These groups become conspicuous for pollinators, promoting uh, cross-pollination and production of viable seed. And at the same time, it's uh, be creating conspicuous resources for seed collectors to find. <laughs> so it, it's a twofer there. And, and the conservation district considers this a best management practice. Good picture of, of humans laying those pods of seed out uh, with the tractor creating that matrix. The good thing about the tractor going through first, it makes walking a little bit easier because uh, you get over a couple inches of snow, it, it, it can wear you out. Nice lines by the tractor, you can see. This, this is a good picture to kind of show you on a larger space. We'll kind of quad out a project area. So we'll use trucks and cones, whatever we can get a hold of to, to kind of mark an area into say four parts. And we'll put a seed mix down for each, call it quad. And that way we'll put assign people to each quad along with that seed mix and we'll get good seed dispersal. So pods spread out through a project area. Okay, other considerations, things that I, I started thinking about recently and I, I recommend if you're not to start, uh, the Boone County Conservation District uh, manages a lot of open space. Our focus is definitely on uh, conservation and creating habitat, but we definitely have sites where different user groups are using, so we have to be thinking about that. We have trailheads, we have trail systems, and, and I'll finally I'll end with, with drainage and, and wetlands. So like I said, the conservation district, we have hiking trails, we have horse trails, we allow for hunting, uh, we have fishing, access for fishing, and then, then canoeing uh, points to put in on, on the Kishwaukee River. So being a land manager, uh, my, I'm habitat first, that I'm habitat centric, I guess. Uh, so when we create perimeter trails from scratch, I'm definitely putting my two cents in. I prefer perimeter trails uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they double as fire breaks so I can make my fire units as, as big as possible and as efficient as possible. Uh, trails, Perimeter trails also act as access points for maintenance and land management operations. So they're, they're good to have in that respect. Um, trails can disrupt uh, a number of species, usually the species that we're trying to help because they're in need of conservation. Uh, trails can create unnatural edges. Predators tend to travel on edges. Predators definitely use um, trails. Generalists, robins, cowbirds, blue jays, not affected by trails, of course, uh, but the birds that the conservation district is concerned with are grassland birds, uh, really tend to avoid being around trails. Uh, and two of the birds that we're really trying to boost populations here are the bobolink and the grasshopper sparrow. So we are really starting to think about where we place our trails and where we have placed trails in the past. And is there a way to, to, to make sure people can still access our sites uh, along with helping these birds in need of conservation? So things definitely to think about. And if you've got say a five acre grassland habitat, right? And you've got a perimeter trail 
and then you've got four trails bisecting it. Uh, you're probably not going to get any grassland, conservative grassland birds to nest there because there's just too much human disturbance. So when you're placing your trails, if you need to place your trails or your, your maintenance uh, two tracks, be, be aware of this. Um, if you have trailheads, if you have mowing equipment coming onto your sites, realize that these are vectors for weeds. Uh, most of our weed populations, new weed populations on our sites are starting in parking lots and on trails, some by human traffic. Uh, so let's say someone is, is hiking around in a riparian uh, habitat, it's, it's muddy, they're amongst reed canary and they move on to high ground or, or onto your trail side. They definitely have reed canary grass in the mud of their boots and that mud is falling along the trails and, and there you go, you just have a new population of reed canary grass. Um, that, that's probably happening, but I think more so with the Boone County Conservation District, we're moving weeds in ourselves with our mowing equipment. We've gotten the Natural Resources Management Department at the Conservation District in the last five, six, seven years has got really diligent in cleaning its equipment between sites. Uh, so if we're out, whether it's mowing fire breaks or mowing uh, invasive weed populations, we always clean our equipment through uh, between sites. And that's kind of a mix of uh, using backpack blowers, hand blowers, as, as well as water, just trying to get things as clean as possible. Uh, we used to have a, a mower with a stump jumper on it, which was really good at protecting the, the gearbox and the blades, but it was also really good at holding weed seeds on. We got a, a simpler mower without that big stump jumper. We have to be a little bit more careful where we mow, but it's a lot easier to clean. It doesn't have any places, uh, not as many nooks and crannies for weeds to hide. So if you've got multiple sites, you're moving equipment for multiple sites, I, I would consider uh, cleaning your equipment. It's five to 10 minutes of time, but I mean, we all know once you get a weed population established, how many hours you're gonna uh, spend fighting that. Um, and then we don't have boot brushes, but something to consider, I suppose. Uh, vandalism is always, always an issue with us. How do we keep a boot brush on site um, without being vandalized or stolen? All right, drainage, something I've been thinking about for a while. If you've got a wetland mitigation, you're constantly thinking about this, I suppose. Uh, if you're working on wetland projects, uh, what are your soils? Where, where's the tie line? Is this a wetland that's been drained in the past? And then what are your local drainage laws? Uh, you don't wanna be breaking the law when you're trying to create your wetland. <clears throat> so this is a picture of what would eventually become a wetland mitigation. And it, this is, we did a tile line survey to figure out what tile was there and what was functioning. So we found the tile, started digging it up to get um, an idea of what we had on our hands. Uh, the tile was functioning, but not very well. We needed to abandon the tile because we needed to create a wetland. Drainage laws within Boone County, um, you must accept water from your neighbor and you cannot back water up onto your neighbor's property. You can't do those things. Um, tile line was coming off the neighbor, so we had to accept their water and we had to take it without backing it up onto their property. So what we ended up doing is we, did, we replaced the tile line and we created, we installed uh, what's called an agri-drain. So what this basically does is it controls the water level within the tile line. So we're able to back the water up in our wetland project while at the same time accepting water from our neighbor. And there are gates within this box where I can control water level. So if I start to back up water onto the neighbor's property, I can take gates out and bring the water down a bit. 
So th this was a win-win. We got our wetland mitigation. It's been a very successful project and we're still taking uh, water from our neighbors. So look into these. I, I'm sure there's a bunch of different types on the market. This was an agri drain. I've, I've experienced with a few of these and uh, they haven't failed me yet. I, I, I like them a lot. So that's all I have for you. I, I thank you for, for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the second half of module four. Thank you so much, Joshua. And with that, we'd like to invite you to come online and uh, we'd like to invite all our participants. If you haven't already, please do go ahead and, and uh, type your questions into the Q&A function box. All right, so um, to begin, um, someone has asked, um, how much is it approximately for a tractor and a loader attachment and where can you get the attachment for seed collection? Um, it, the sky's the limit on tractors, I suppose. You, <laughs> they're, they're not getting any cheaper. Um, that little John Deere utility tractor, you could probably get new for for $20,000-ish. I would think it's been a while since I've shopped for new tractors. Um, a tractor is something you could always purchase used to, uh, pretty easy to work on compared to, to a, a car. Uh, so it, it's that's a tough one to answer, but the you're probably best if you're you're interested in purchasing machinery for, for seed harvest, probably do a Google search and look, there's a, a bunch of different kinds. The one that we purchased, it's it's been five or six years now. I think that at the time cost about $13,000 and we did the math on it and it was going to cost seven, it was going to take seven years to collect enough seed to pay it off. But we thought, well, conservation district <laughs> keeps their equipment till the bitter end. So we'll easily get 20 years out of it. So that we thought was a good purchase to make. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there's several questions about uh, seeding on snow. Um, there are a couple of people have asked, uh, what is the ideal depth of the snow to broadcast on top? And is there um, a, a depth that's, that's too deep? Uh, there's definitely a depth that's too deep. A lot of it will have to deal with um, what's your equipment. If you've got a four-wheel drive tractor and people that are in good shape, you're going to be able to handle six inches of snow pretty easily, I would think. You get above six inches of snow, it's really hard to walk through. Your tractor struggles, especially if it's not four-wheel drive. And then another thing to consider is usually these areas where seeding are pretty wide open, so drifting becomes an issue. So we, we don't mess around. Once we get that first snow, which I'm hoping will be in the next two, three, four weeks, we hit it just it, like last winter here in Northern Illinois, we had serious uh, snow totals towards by February, but we, we got all of our seeding done shortly after the new year, which was perfect. And then we got a bunch of snow to come on top of that, which protected the seed from pre predators. Um, one question I get a lot of with seeding is, well, aren't all the wildlife eating your seed? And, and in the many years I've been doing this, I've never noticed a lack of diversity because of predation. So what happens when you, you uh, seed on top of snow, usually the seeds are darker in color. If the sun's out, they warm up and they tend to melt through the snow and then they're protected. So one more thing to consider that I don't think I touched on. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question related to that is what site prep what site prep and soil conditions do you want going into winter before broadcast seeding? Um, and you noted that the pictures look like they have there's cut stubble. Yeah, so it, it depends a lot on what you had to start with. Um, if it's a, a, a fallow area or or a nightmare of succession, I prefer total vegetation control. So you've got if you do multiple years of total vegetation control, by that the end of that second year, you usually have pretty bare soils and that's pretty ideal. Uh, but we, if it's an agriculture conversion, 
uh, soybeans. So if you're going to be planting, make sure you or the farmer uh, producer puts it into soybeans the final year. A lot easier to broadcast on top of soybeans than, than corn stover or corn stubble. It's just harder to get seed soil contact on top of corn, uh, harvested corn. Uh, harvested soybeans is such a clean, perfect seed bed. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question um, comes from Arkansas um, and they ask, if you live in an area that gets very little snow, can you still broadcast in the winter and is it effective? Um, I would think so. Um, the, the hard thing would be knowing where you've put your seed when it comes to broadcasting methods. We use a broadcaster and it's really easy with the snow. One thing you might want to look into if, if you don't get snow or drop seeders, it's the same principle, but I think it's a little easier to, to calibrate and, and uh, be confident on where your seed is, has been. So maybe uh, Google drop seeder and, and take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple questions in regard uh, regarding uh, fillers and carrying a carrier agents. Um, and they ask if you have a preferred uh, carrier agent, uh, rice holes, kitty litter, et cetera, um, to use when you're broadcasting or when you're drilling. Yeah, so with our, our larger seed, we use prairie brome as our carrier, which might sound crazy, but give it a try. And then with our, our smaller seed, we like uh, sawdust. We've got a local sawmill pretty close by where they give us, for very cheap, a truck full of sawdust, and then we screen it, and uh, it works really well to help throw our small seed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, do you measure seed viability before planting? And how much does that relate to your seeds per square foot? We don't, I wish we did. Uh, we just, we're, we're small. Our natural resources management department is, is two people along, like I said, multiple times with, with a crew of volunteers. So that, that's not my world. I wish it was uh, something hopefully down the line though. And then another question in regard to seeds is how long uh, do your seeds uh, typically spend in storage? Usually we, we like to get stuff out as quick as possible. The longest it usually stays in storage is two years and then it's out. We're always, whatever's going in storage has a home. It's just a matter of how long it takes to get to that home. And usually it's no more than two seasons two years. Thank you. Um, Athena asked, uh, do, the, do large seeding machines contribute significantly to soil compaction? And is there concern for that? Um, I, I would think if it's a large enough machine, it, it would compact the soil. The good thing with the technique that we're using now is there's snow on the ground and the ground is frozen. And our, our equipment isn't all that big really. The biggest tool we use for seeding is a 50 horsepower tractor. It's got wide, wide turf tires on it. I don't know what the exact uh, PSI is on it, um, but for us, I, I, I'm not concerned about compaction. Um, and somewhat related to that, um, Leva asked, when you say winter planting, are you referring to early winter or late winter? And does that depend on snowfall? Yeah, it, for us, it hinges on snowfall. Right now, yesterday we had a volunteer day and vol volunteers were cleaning seed and getting seed mixes together. Um, and hopefully as soon as we get that first snow, we'll be ready to go. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, the next question, um, can you talk more about uh, planting sequences and strategies? Uh, do you recommend planting forbs first and then grasses? Um, we usually, I, I don't think it matters with the broadcast method. Um, what, I, what I noticed, it seemed like with the drilling, you gave the grasses 
a huge advantage when it came to, to germination and, and putting growth on. With the broadcast method, everything gets put on a level playing field. So we, we definitely have different seed mixes. So we'll have our grasses and our uh, larger forb seeds go in a mix and then our smaller seeds go in a mix, but they're all put down at the same time. Um, and ever since we started with the broadcast method, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate or be over dramatic, but it's almost nature preserve quality plantings at this point compared to what it was in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s with that method, in my humble opinion. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And very interesting that you see different results with the broadcast yeah. over snow versus using a, a drill seeder. I do, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, can you talk a little more about your experience uh, with non-ideal or failed establishment? When, when do you and how do you measure success rates and how do you make the final decision to start over? I don't want, I don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> the, the project that with the silo in it, that was at uh, distillery conservation area. And, and I struggle. I don't think I have a cut and dry start over. We're definitely stubborn and we probably hold on to failed projects too long. Um, and a failed project would, would pretty much be the weeds uh, outnumber the natives and we start to see monocultures of weeds where we're just not getting the diversity that we need. So when our, our goal really is to have as many blooms throughout a growing season as we possibly can get for pollinators. And the natives do the best job at that. You, I mean, some of these invasive species provide habitat. The first uh, Bombus affinis I, I ever saw was on a honeysuckle. But the problem with honeysuckle and buckthorn is they eventually create these monocultures where that's all you get is one or two blooms in that spot, spot during the growing season. So we want as many blooms as possible. We want something blooming through the growing season. I guess at this point, that's really what we're looking for. If it, to define success, do we have a lot of blooms throughout the growing season? Preferably native, <laughs> preferably high quality. Yeah. Fantastic, yes. Um, and can you talk a little more about interseeding and strategies for interseeding? Yeah, I'm not very good at it. Um, I, I haven't had much luck with it. When, when we do do interseedings, uh, we usually do it after fire and we lay the seed on really thick. Um, I just, I haven't had much luck with it. I know others have, but I have not. Thank you, fair enough. <laughs> yes. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one participant has asked, uh, what is the best way to clean milkweed seeds? Do you have any tricks that you can share? I do. Uh, <laughs> get them right before they pop and uh, kind of peel away that, that husk and then just take the seeds and just kind of with your fingers, grab them off the silk into a bag. Yeah, it works really well if you can time it. We had a record. I think we collected... 16 pounds of common milkweed this year out in the field cleaning it as we went and it it was it's pretty when you see that much common milkweed in one spot <laughs> Wonderful. okay and this is a great question i believe to wrap up uh rick says great information josh do you have other recommended resources for where others can learn about best practices for native vegetation installation and management to minimize any trial and error experiences beyond this webinar series? Ooh, boy. Um, that's a good question. I can't think of any offhand. Uh, definitely drop me an email and I'll start thinking about that. Maybe the Grassland Restoration Network would be a good one. Um, the gentleman out in Nebraska with TNC, is it Chris Helzer, the ecologist? He'd be a good one. Uh, those are the two off the top of my head, but that'd be a fun conversation to have, so drop me a line. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you again so much for your presentation and for taking the time today to join us to answer all these wonderful questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Everybody enjoy your day. And with that, um, I'm excited to introduce um, our next presentation, uh, Shane Otto and Lars Higdon. Uh, Shane has been working as the Land Restoration Specialist for the Dane County Parks in Madison, Wisconsin for the last four years. Prior to that, Shane worked for 12 years with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Leo at Leopold Wetland Management District in Portage, Wisconsin, in the Horicon Marsh near Maryville, Wisconsin. In 2017, Shane was recognized by his peers by receiving the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Region 3 Torch Award. The award is given to individuals who demonstrate commitment to the fire program and inspire others during the fire season. Lars Higdon has been the botanist and naturalist for, with the Dane County Parks in South Central Wisconsin since 2016. As a botanist and naturalist, he enjoys closely working with a large workforce of volunteers to restore prairies, savannas, wood, and woodlands. Lars has worked in multiple capacities, managing and restoring natural communities in Wisconsin, as well as in Southern California. Lars holds a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Please welcome Shane Otto and Lars Higdon. Hello everyone, I'm Land Restoration Specialist at Dane County Parks, Shane Otto and Lars Higdon, Dane County Parks botanist naturalist, and I will be presenting to you today about uh, early stage prairie management. We'd like to tell you a little bit about our, our park system here in Dane County. Um, we have approximately 13,000 acres of parkland to, to manage here. Um, roughly 9,000 acres of that is uh, wildlands that, that we um, would like to manage someday. Um, Dane County consists of about 600,000 people and it's the second largest uh, population of any county in the state and it's also has the uh, fastest growing population of any county in the state. Lars and myself are the uh, two permanent employees who are involved with managing our, our lands. We have um, approximately five limited term employees that help us along with some operations staff that get involved from time to time in our land management activities, especially uh, prescribed fire. Uh, we have two Operation Fresh Start crews that help us out, along with a, a third graduate crew, which will be joining us um, in two weeks here, as well as 3,000 volunteers who put in approximately 70,000 hours of volunteer service annually for our park system. So Lars and I would like to thank Project Wingspan for having us um, present to all of you today. And with, with that, um, why don't we get started? Lars, next slide, please. Slide, please. So keys to success. Um, we, we really wanna talk about, um, you know, goals and objectives and understanding, you know, what, what to expect and having realistic expectations about a prairie planting. You know, if you're spending $1,500 to $3,000 per acre to plant a prairie, you wanna see some results. And one thing that we need to be realistic about is when you're going to see those results. And oftentimes it's not right away. If you're really lucky in the first or second season, you're going to see what's something that resembles a prairie, but it's probably really going to be three to five years when you really have a nice diverse prairie out there. And some of the um, species that, that take a while to establish might not be present 
for up to 10 years in, uh, in your prairie planting. So, you know, you really need to be patient when we're talking about uh, planting a prairie and understanding that this early stage prairie management, you're, you're not going to see um, some of the climatic species like compass plant and, and, and the blazing stars right off the bat. So first of all, let's start off with, with um, having the right expectations. Next slide, Lars. Then we want to talk about having a good plan. You know, this is a prescribed burn on one of our properties. It's about a 300 acre prescribed burn we're, we're conducting here. And say, what does that have to do with early stage prairie management? Um, nothing really, other than to pull off a burn like that um, with a bunch of staff and, and volunteers takes a lot of planning. And it's no different for, um, you know, a, a prairie planning. Um, Dane County Parks that that might start in, in our with our planners office, um, putting together a master plan after we um, purchase the park. We're talking about how you know that that um, oftentimes what was a farm um, gets established into a park, and how the lands will be restored uh, moving forward. So our planners might be involved. Um, our local farmers, cooperative farmers, oftentimes will, will help manage our, our agricultural fields until it's time to restore those lands. So we have to have a good plan in place with our, our farmers. Um, and that, that plan would include um, seedbed preparation for our prairie planting, you know, which oftentimes is a two or three year process of going from corn to the final stages of uh, Roundup Ready soybean, no-till no soybeans to plant into. And then of course, we as land management staff have to prepare to either harvest the seed or purchase the seed to get ready to um, plant that, that field. And then after the, the planting happens, of course, we have to manage the, the planting as well. And how are we going to do that? Next slide. Mowing. That's how we're going to, you know, deal with our newly established prairie. Again, this is all about goals and objectives. And when we're talking about um, long live perennials in our prairies, we're talking about driving the roots down on these plants the first couple of years, um, and then. You know, as the prairie continues to age, we're going to start to see some of that above ground growth. So we believe it's key to get on top of the annual weeds to stop the weed seed production. And what's even a bigger um, issue is shading out of our young uh, prairie plants. So we want to get in there June 1st, July 1st, August 1st typically, um, but you really have to, um, you know, be out there doing field observations, making sure that that's the right time to be mowing. You, the last thing you want to do is have a, a cooperative farmer go out and, and mow a field for you in June when it doesn't need to be mowed. Um, so making sure those field observations are correct, getting the mower out there at the proper time is important because important, excuse me, um, because on any given circumstance, that June 1st as your, as your first mowing may be July 1st and then all the way um, to sub sep September for your last mowing as well. Next slide. So this is a interesting um, slide. This photo was taken right about that June 1st time frame. It's the same prairie planting. And on the left-hand side, you can see the, the mustard in this photo is, is almost up to the uh, shoulders of our LTE Tom Klein. Tom, Tom's about six foot tall. And a little further up slope, we'll see in the right-hand photo here, um, a bunch of annual ryegrass that um, we planted at a very light rate to help stabilize this very, very, very steep slope that it was planted on. So um, after doing the site visit, we contacted our cooperative farmer and made sure that he got onto the site as soon as he could. So neither of these species could go to seed. And 
um, really had great success. The farmer was able to make it out within a week. Um, it was great to have a good relationship with, with him and his flexibility to get out there in such a timely manner. So after the, the mowing took place, the pioneer species were underneath and we actually started seeing some um, blackhead Susan's bloom. Next slide, please, Lars. Weeds to worry about. You know, what? what is a weed? Talk about in our pesticide management, it's anything we don't want to be, be there pretty much, right? A lot of these um, agricultural fields are gonna have lots of uh, annual weeds and with farmers farming farming them for such a long period of time um, it's not often where they have some of these uh, perennial or biennial weeds like the crown vetch uh, bird's foot trefoil spotted knapweed um, or even um, leafy spurge so what what's going to happen if you have a, a situation like this um, where you have crown vetch coming up, um, you know, you're going to want to get out there and herbicide this as soon as possible. Um, you know, you just spent all that, that time and money, um, on, on the seed and planting and all that stuff. Um, if this, this is what your planting looks like, I'm, I'm guessing you probably didn't take really good steps into prepping the seedbed, um, with the cooperative, you know, farmer and, and having having a little bit of site seedbed prep beforehand. But if that maybe maybe there was some crown vetch seed in the seed you purchased and this is what you end up with. So you got to get out there and take care of it. Um, and herbicides are probably the way that you have to do it. Um, we oftentimes will uh, use some milestone tolerant uh, forbs in our mixes. So if we do have a situation occur like this, that um, you know we're still going to have a relatively diverse prairie um, with those with those species that are going to be tolerant to the milestone. So um, next slide: yarrow and black-eyed Susan cover cropping. I guess this really isn't a cover cropping system like you know you might think of in an agricultural setting. But what we found is, you know, if you go fairly heavy um, on your planting rate with yarrow and black-eyed Susan, it kind of acts as a, as a cover crop. Um, gets established quickly and comes up and helps to fend off the prairie space from the, from the uh, annual weeds that you ha might have coming in. This particular planting was mowed one time. It was heavy with mare's tail. And after the, the initial mowing, um, the yarrow and black eyed Susan, as you can see, have, have taken over. Um, mare's tail is, is present, but not nearly as thick. And uh, this particular planting is a 45 acre dog park um, in our park system that's now two years old and um, is, is much more diverse. We collected uh, asters off that property this year. Um, as well as the Black Eyed Susans, Bergamot, and, and, and Yarrow as well. But there's many more species that are um, been, been observed in that, in that planting, and it's looking uh, great, and we're hoping that that planting is going to be a great success. So that, that's an option uh, or a technique that, that we're probably going to continue to use because it seems to be very successful. Next slide, Lars. Year two prairie establishment. Hopefully year one, you were vigilant about staying on top of the weeds, both the annual weeds and any perennials that might be coming in. Um, if so, your second year will be much easier and you'll be off in the, the right direction. Um, however, there's still a chance you, you may need to mow. Uh, Based on your field observations, uh, you'll have to make that decision. Um, if your second year planting is coming on strong with natives and there aren't too many annual or perennial weeds in among your site, uh, you may be able to get away without mowing or maybe only mowing once, um, but that'll be based on your observations in the field. 
if you're seeing a lot of weeds, similar to what you were seeing in year one, a uh, lot of mare's tail, thistles, uh, foxtail, um, you're gonna need to get out there and start mowing. Again, keep the mowing up. You really wanna make sure to keep that sunlight going down to your young, young prairie plants down below. Uh, you really don't want them to get smothered at any point during the first couple of years. So you'll have to pay attention to your site, do regular site visits and decide uh, what to do with your management based on what you're seeing in the field. If you're getting natives coming up, but there's still a lot of weeds, um, mow over the top of those natives. Uh, if you have the ability to lift the deck on the mower, you can lift it just above the height of the natives and mow it off so that the natives have got full sun and the weeds are nice and short. Here in this picture in the lower right hand corner is a couple basil leaves of some black eyed Susans. And that's what this mower did here, just went right over the top of those natives, knocked back the annuals. And uh, in a few weeks, the natives will have taken advantage of that sunlight and they'll grow bigger, stronger, and able to uh, sustain themselves. Um, as soon as you start seeing a lot of natives coming in, maybe some of them are even flowering, uh, you can back off on the mowing or you can mow only in spot areas, spot treat, treat certain areas with, with the mower. Um, here we have some prairie smoke that's blooming on the left. On the right, we've got some wild quinine that's blooming, black-eyed Susans, partridge pea. When your natives are coming on strong like this, uh, you can back off the mowing and focus more on uh, spot treatment, selective, more surgical techniques, getting the shovel out, digging weeds, um, pulling, maybe some uh, brush cutter work, knock back, um, anything. Uh, but you really don't need or, or want to mow across the whole site um, with a 16 foot mower at this point. Um, you can sort of let the natives uh, occupy the site, take up room, and um, they're capable of offending for themselves when you get to this point. Um, here in year two or three, we've got some ironweed, some primrose, black-eyed Susans, all blooming. They're starting to take up a lot of room, uh, pushing out all the annual weeds. At this point, you're really only looking for those nasty perennial species that Shane mentioned, maybe sweet clovers, uh, parsnips, uh, trying to get on top of those as quickly as possible. Typically, the, the periphery of the site, around the edge of roads, uh, fallow ditch edges, you know, around the perimeter of the edge of the wood line, that's where you're gonna probably see the majority of your problematic species, your uh, parsnips, sweet clovers, stuff that wasn't getting um, eliminated through the row cropping that occurred on that site in the past. Uh, or has come in since the, the row crop agriculture is, is ended, coming in from the periphery, that's where you're gonna wanna spend a lot of time, time checking to make sure um, you've gotten all those species under control before they can grow up and go to seed. Um, and then of course, year three, maybe year four, as soon as you get enough thatch, a fuel accumulated on the site, you're gonna wanna burn. Um, get that thatch lifted off the site, get those nutrients released into the soil, uh, warm that ground up, let those native prairie seedlings uh, just take those nutrients and, and go off and, and become really strong and vigorous. Uh, they'll begin to really push out the weeds at this point and everything will more or less start to fend for itself. Uh, as soon as you get their, the first burn in there, uh, the, really, the prairie really starts to take form and uh, is capable of sustaining itself with minimal uh, intervention. And then uh, as your prairie develops, looks more mature, uh, plants are starting to bloom, occupy space, um, you can um, 
dial back a little bit and just continue to monitor, monitor the site for any uh, nasty perennial weeds that might be encroaching. Uh, and of course, um, as you get your vegetation established, uh, the wildlife will start to move in. You might have some grassland birds coming into your site that you didn't have in the past. And in this case, you've got a Carner blue butterfly that's coming down to uh, the lupin in this restored prairie. So that's a summary of um, early stage prairie management, years one, two, and three. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we can take those now. Fantastic, thank you so much, Lars and Shane. Um, and with that, we'd like to uh, invite um, Lars to come off mute and start his camera. And for all our participants, if you haven't already, please go ahead and uh, type your questions into the Q&A function box. Um, our first question is, what is milestone and what species are milestone tolerant? That's a good question. Milestone is an herbicide that came out maybe a decade ago. It's got a pretty low toxicity. Only a small amount is needed during an application. Um, it's very selective and a lot of our natives are tolerant of, of milestone. Um, we use it a lot on black locust, crown vetch, bird's foot trefoil, um, and several species are native, several native species are, are fairly tolerant of it. As I said, um, I don't know exactly off the top of my, my head all of them. You can Google search that and find it pretty quick. There's a pretty good publication. I think it's on TechLine News. Uh, that you can reference, but um, bergamot um, that happens to be one off the top of my head that I know. Um, it varies throughout the list of, of natives, though. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Arlene, and she asks, how do you use herbicide without inadvertently uh, killing the desired plants? Right, so in a new prairie planting, you want to be very careful to limit your use of herbicide, if at all possible. That's why we stress mowing um, as much as possible um, to get the, the annuals and perennials knocked back and that sunlight getting down to the ground. Um, we only want to use herbicide if it's a species like uh, crown vetch or bird's foot trefoil, something that's really nasty, deep-rooted perennial that will take over and, and compromise your site if left um, unmanaged. So we, we have to be very judicious, uh, very surgical, um, backpack sprayers, uh, small scale application equipment um, to, to make sure we're not impacting our, our, our natives. But certainly there can be drift and off target um, damage to natives if, if you're not careful. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, about specific species, um, and they're asking, what is the best way to deal with large areas of giant foxtail grass? Hmm. Um, so, so mowing is a great technique for, for foxtail. Yeah, it's an annual. Um, it won't last long. As soon as you get some uh, sunlight down the ground, sunlight to your perennials, they'll slowly start to push it out. Um, a lot of our annual weeds, including foxtail, are, are big and scary looking at first, that first year when they're taking advantage of all that space, all that bare ground, all that sunlight. They come in like gangbusters, um, but they don't last long uh, in the face of competition, especially uh, perennial natives with deep roots. They'll, they'll push those out over time and, and you can use mowing to tip that um, advantage in, in your favor uh, to help speed up the process. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie asks is, asks if there's a chart or a resource to know what time um, of year to mow and or at what height. Right, so um, we, we typically plan on three mowings uh, a summer, roughly June, July, August. Uh, we have gotten away without having to mow a prairie even once. They just came in really well. 
Uh, there weren't very many weeds, even annual weeds in this particular prairie that I'm thinking of. Other prairies we've had to mow uh, three times a year for two years. So it all just depends on what you're seeing in the field, uh, what, what you're seeing um, with the weeds. Um, so it could be anywhere from zero or one mowings all the way up to six mowings over the course of two years. Um, just making sure that you're preventing those annuals from getting big and tall and blocking all the sunlight getting down to your natives underneath. Um, if you have the ability to lift the deck on the mower while you're mowing your plantings, just, just lift it to the height right above the natives. So maybe that first June of the first year, the natives are only a couple inches tall and you can drop that deck really low. Um, the second year, maybe those natives are a foot tall and if you can lift that deck up just about right above the natives, then that's that's perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Connie. Um, she's asking about what time of year um, is recommended for our first burn? Um, well, our best burn window um, is, is typically, you know, spring. So March, April. Um, as soon as you can get it in is when you should do it. Uh, you might want to be a little careful the first year or two not to burn too late into the spring when, you're, when your native prairie plants are, are small and tender and a little bit vulnerable to disturbance. They haven't put on that, that root system with energy reserves quite yet. So if you injure them with hot fire when they're just germinating, it's probably not a good thing. Um, so you probably want to err on the side of burning a little too early rather than, than too late. So late March in, into the early side of April. Thank you. Um, another question about milestone. Um, how long do you let milestone tolerant native species grow before you apply milestone to an area to control invasives? Yeah, good question. Um, and every species has a different tolerance. So this isn't across the board um, for, for every one of your prairie plants, but you know, a small native seedling is probably gonna be pretty sensitive to milestone herbicide. Uh, even if the, the guide tells you that it, it is tolerant, it, it may still be sensitive when it's small, just like it's sensitive to fire when it's young. Um, so you probably wanna wait until maybe uh, mid-season uh, before you start doing any herbicide applications with Milestone. Oh, thank you. Um, Abby asks, um, if you're not able to burn a site, what would be the second most preferred method for long-term management? Right, so, so burning is pretty important, um, but if you can't get in there to burn, mowing, um, is probably your next best option. Um, if you can mow and hay it to get the thatch off the site entirely, that's even better. Um, but uh, mowing would be what you'd want to do if you can't burn. Um, another question about uh, burning. Um, do you, fall, do, do you uh, conduct fall burnings in newer prairie plantings? Um, would it promote cool season plants that are normally um, at a lower rate in a seed mix? Hmm. Promote cool season plants. Um, you know, may maybe, but um, really try to get your burns in whenever you can. Um, burning is great, whether you can do it spring or fall. It's always going to be beneficial to your site. If you happen to, you know, tip the balance and favor the, the cool season one year, you can compensate it by doing a, a late spring burn the next year. Um, the key for me really isn't so much necessarily the timing, but just making sure the site gets burned regularly enough. Um, I think a lot of times people are, are just too cautious um, and, and don't get enough fire on the ground. And, and then the site, the site starts to suffer because of that. So I wouldn't get too wrapped up on favoring the forbs, favoring the grasses. When is this burn 
um, what is this burn doing um, necessarily as much as just making sure to get that site burned regularly enough and then and then varying the times when, when it gets burned not so it's burned on March 15th every year in perpetuity just kind of switch it up from time to time. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, Eric asks, uh, what management strategies uh, can drive root depth? Root depth. Well, um, fire, <laughs> if you get that thatch off the ground, um, get those nutrients released in the soil, um, get those plants good and happy, they're just going to do what they do. And a, a lot of our prairie plants, they just put on deep roots and they're going to do that naturally. So making them as, as happy as, as possible is going to drive those roots nice and deep. So a lot of times that's fire and sp invasive species management, um, keeping the invaders away, uh, just keeping those plants happy and they're going to do what they want to do. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, um, if you're installing both plugs, potted plants and seed, do you recommend mowing over both the plugs? The plugs and live plants or, or just the seeded plants? Um, if, if you're installing plugs, you're probably working on a, a smaller scale uh, planting, maybe the, the rain garden or, or a small prairie. Um, and you might be able to selectively hand weed or, or weed whip some of those uh, annual weeds away. If you can be selective on that smaller scale, that's, that's even better. Um, if you have to mow across the whole site, um, that's fine too. Uh, the drawback is when you use a big, large mower, 16 feet long, it's really fast and efficient, um, but it's not as precise. So um, you're gonna lose some of your precision. You're gonna mow off some of your natives that you probably don't wanna mow if you can choose not to. Um, certainly they're gonna recover they're gonna sprout back, um, but it is gonna set them back a little bit. So um, if you can be more precise with, with your um, operation, all, all the better. Thank you. Um, and next question is, what is the best way to increase biodiversity in a restoration that is under 10 years old? That is under 10 years old? Um, you know, continuing to overseed bringing in some of your long-lived conservative species, your, your lead plant and your, your silphiums, uh, bringing seed in, burning regularly, um, creating those conditions that seeds like to germinate in. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently in the last 10 years or so about using hemi, hemi parasites, uh, wood betony, for example, uh, as a driver of diversity in prairie planting. So um, introducing the species will, will um, uh, help to suppress some of your more aggressive native prairie plants, some of your aggressive grasses that sometimes compromise the diversity of a site. Um, so having wood betony in uh, would perhaps create some openings um, to allowing some other species to come in uh, especially if you're seeding in those long-lived prairie conservatives, the, the lead plants and baptisia and silphiums, um, having, lead, having wood betony in, in the mix uh, really would, would allow those species to come in. And, and then just making sure you, you keep on top of the invasives and, and regular maintenance through, through burning. Thank you. Um, our next question is about uh, grazing and the use of grazing in place of fire. Um, and they're wondering if do you, if you have used that as as an application. You know, I, I don't have a lot of experience with grazing. It, it's not something that's heavily used um, as as a way that um, we manage our, our grasslands. So I, I really can't speak too much to that point. Um, other than you know, it's a it's a natural process um, with our our large herbivores that we we have and have had on the landscape in the past. So having um, some grazers come in, um, maybe creating some disturbance, some opportunity for seeds to germinate and establish, um, add, it adds that complexity to your site, that structural complexity and those processes that are natural 
um, that these species evolved um, to live with and evolved, evolved to depend on. I, I think it can only um, be, a, be a good thing if, if done in a managed controlled um, setting so that the site isn't getting too impacted, too overly grazed. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and we have time for a few more questions. Um, uh, someone asked about the control of miscanthus grass. Okay, so miscanthus, and this is one I'm seeing more of in the southern Wisconsin area, sort of a um, ornamental grass uh, that appears to spread through rhizomes, maybe a little bit through seed as well with big fluffy tassels on top. Um, we've been seeing it popping up more and more and we're starting to treat it um, and, and we're using uh, Polaris or a appear as a foliar application uh, to treat this during the growing season. Um, it's been particularly hard to kill for us uh, just using glyphosate. Um, so we, we're trying a mazapir now and we seems like we've been starting to have some success, but I haven't been tackling it for, for too long. Um, but it does appear in our region to be um, popping up more and more and, and probably becoming more problematic. Something to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, how do you control European brome grass? Right. So that, that's a tricky one. Um, it's sort of a background weed that um, is pretty much everywhere. Um, we, we don't often do a lot of direct management with brome grasses. Uh, regular burning, regular fire uh, will, will tend to discourage brome grasses and a lot of your cool season grasses. Um, although it may not eliminate them, it keeps their impact minimal and um, put some more into the background. So I, I would just encourage regular regular burning, regular fire, whenever you can get it in uh, to, to try to battle these weeds. Um, if you start going in too, too heavy, too strong with, with herbicides and such, you, you might be doing more damage than good. Um, so we, tip, we typically just manage with, with fire for, for most of our cool season grasses. Oh, thank you. Um, Arlene is asking about uh, it's wood betony. Um, just to do not understand the use of wood betony to um, and its use uh, to increase biodiversity. Um, can you explain a little more about uh, wood betony and hemiparasites and and their use in integration right. to help biodiversity? Right. So, wood betony and its cousin swamp betony um, are hemiparasites. So they are they're green. Uh, plants um, that photosynthesize and uh, create energy that way, but they also um, have specialized root systems underground that connect to the root systems of other plants and uh, parasitize water, minerals, nutrients uh, from those species around them. And they are non-selective. They'll parasitize anything that can, can get their roots attached to. Um, and uh, most people might say, oh, parasites are, you know, a bad thing, but um, in this case, they're uh, a natural, uh, natural um, process in our communities, and they help to discourage certain species um, and then allow other species to come in. Um, so one of the, the cases that we often see is Tall grasses are often a problem in our prairie plantings. Um, they become pretty abundant. Um, they're, they're competitive. Uh, they tend to squeeze out uh, other natives. And if uh, wood betony is introduced, um, they'll do a pretty good job of, of suppressing those warm season grasses and providing a little bit of a, a foothold for, for other less conservative or less aggressive um, more diminutive, smaller stature species to be able to, to come in. Um, I not totally understand, it's, it's not totally understood how, how this whole process occurs and why some species are um, affected more than others by, by wood betony, um, but certainly you can see examples um, out in, in prairies where it occurs 
and it, it typically is found in areas where the species diversity is higher, the stature of the prairie is, is much lower, um, and it's, it's a really uh, potential, nifty potential tool to use in these grassier sites um, that you want to diversify a little bit more. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that is all of our questions for today. Um, I would like to, again, thank Lars uh, and, and Shane uh, for their presentation. And thank you so much, Lars, for sticking around and, and helping us answer some of these questions live. Um, and uh, with that, there we go. There we go. Um, and with that, that concludes our fourth workshop. Um, again, I'd like to extend our gratitude and sincere thanks to Joshua Sage, Shane Otto, and Lars Higdon for their phenomenal presentations. And again, to extend our appreciation to all of you for your participation. We invite you to join us for our final workshop next Wednesday, December 8th, which will be focused on long-term management considerations and strategies, disturbance, prescribed fire, and the importance of managing succession, and the importance of monitoring um, specifically looking at incorporating the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program or IMP program into your project. Thank you all again so much. Take good care. Bye-bye.